We are so grateful that you've decided to join us on this Tuesday Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks again for your many blessings. You have showered us with so many. You've given us love and companionship in this life. You've blessed us with financial resources to put food on our table. There are many who are less fortunate, and we ask you to help us to seek them out and to be a blessing. And we pray, God, that you would again turn us to the true reason for this season, which is the birth of a baby boy in Bethlehem, Jesus Christ, who became Lord of the world. We do give you thanks for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to be taking a look at material blessings today. You've been richly blessed. Many of you who are watching, you are probably cognizant of the fact that there are many people around you that have lost their jobs, that are struggling to make ends meet. This is what this lesson is about. People who are caught in a cycle of despair and poverty and do not know where else to turn for their help. You have the opportunity to be a blessing. You have the opportunity, if you have been material blessed, materially blessed, to be a blessing, to give of what you have, to feed the poor, to clothe the naked, to care for those who need God's love. And so we take advantage of those opportunities we get them. But for many people, they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. It is imperative that we be generous, for this is the work of the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, we are going to take a look at an Old Testament lesson today that talks from the perspective of people who are caught in that cycle of despair. And so let me set up the background of Isaiah chapter 40. Now, this was written sometime around 580 or so BC. We can't know exactly the date, but we know it was during the Babylonian captivity. Now, if you're thinking, wait a minute, Babylonian captivity, remember how we said that Isaiah was written at least in three different parts? Chapters 1 to 39 was probably the original Isaiah, and then, of course, he passed the school of Isaiah, Isaiah shipped prophecy on to a new generation, and it got passed down to this generation, and they wrote in the name of the school of Isaiah's prophecy. So there were prophets, again, alive at this time. This, again, as I mentioned to you, was during the Babylonian captivity. So it's not the original Isaiah. So again, they are in Babylon. If you remember what happened in Babylon, this country, Babylon, attacked the nation of Israel, destroyed everything, just raised the whole country, and they took all the young men and all the young women and all the people with strong bodies, enslaved them, and took them back to Mesopotamia. And so these folks, oh my goodness, who were left in Jerusalem, were filled with great despair. Their country has been destroyed. Their government is gone. They are surrounded by enemies. They have no way that they can find to, to farm or make a living. Everything that they do have is being stolen or taken from them. Now you get the type of strains and pressures. There's no social security. There's no safety net for these people. They are completely without hope. So, the other thing that we need to understand is the land. Remember, the promised land that was promised to Jerusalem, or to the Jews, was a provisional promise. Many of the promises of God are unconditional. God's love is unconditional. You will always have God's love. But this was a provisional promise. If you do this, I will support you and give to you a land, God said. From the Jewish perspective, they disobeyed the provisions of their contract with God, so the land was taken from them. Oh, let's put a big, let's put a big red one over here. Okay, the land was taken from them. They had no reason to expect that God would continue to bless them in the land. So during this period, they were also trying to figure out what does that mean about a relationship with God? We always defined ourselves based upon our relationship with God as expressed through the land. This is gone. So where is God? What is our relationship with God during this type of season? So here they are, filled with despair and grave danger of death, poverty, 
they're dying. So the purpose of this lesson is that it be a healing word. A healing word in a time of despair. Now see, here's my problem with the politics of this world and how things happen today. People like to pile on when people are going through great despair or when they're going through a time of great loss. Ha, I told you. Ha, you shouldn't have done that. Ha, you could have taken care of yourself. Ha, you should have planned better. We pile on people who are already going through suffering and struggling. Well, I'm not there, so the fact that I'm not there and you are, well, that's all your fault and your decision and your problem. We pile on. We make their despair worse. It reminds me of a story. We actually, um, we had a fellow, no matter how bad things were in your life, it was always worse for him. <laughs> he said, well, you think you got a problem? I remember one day, the true, true story, true story. Um, I actually had to go over, I was here in the church with a group of people, and um, I walked over to the, the, the parsonage to grab something. There's a, one of the garages filled with all these church supplies and so forth. And as I was opening up the garage door, the garage door collapsed and literally fell down on top of my neck. It's one of those very heavy doors, 300 pound doors. And uh, so it's the old school, very thick, heavy doors. And, and fortunately, as it fell, it hit my neck, it fell on top of something and, and just fortunately prevented my neck from being crushed. I walk back to the church and I'm just a mess. I'm a little bit shaken up by this. And, and, and the one guy looks at me and says, what happened? And I told him what happened. He said, well, you think you've got problems? I've got the sniffles. I mean, something really insignificant like that. I literally almost had my neck crushed, and there was something worse, the sniffles for him. That was even worse. You know, they pile on. They don't listen. You feel like you're alone. You feel like you've been abandoned. Now here's the thing, the prophet Isaiah, in this case, is tender. I love this about this chapter. He's really tender. He's very tender to the people. He doesn't pile on and make things worse for them. He doesn't exacerbate their circumstances. Now this passage, which is one of the most famous passages in the entire book of Isaiah, we almost exclusively as Christians apply to Jesus Christ. But you have to understand, the Jews certainly did not understand this as applying to the Messiah that was to come. Some Messiah in the future date to the Jesus that we celebrate. It had meaning to them, separated from the context of the Messiah. And so let's take a look at what they would have found comforting. And then let's find out why we should find this comforting still to this day. Verse 1. I love verse 1. Let me read to you this famous passage. And maybe for those of you who are uh, Handel's Messiah fanatics, and of course it's that season, we won't get the opportunity to go, of course, to Heinz Hall and hear it like we often get to. But you'll hear this is a part of the Messiah. Comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Boy, that's about all I have to say. So again, they're going through great tragedy. They're suffering, they're starving. Comfort, comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. Her sin has been paid for. She's received from the Lord's hand double her sins. Now, this passage, that verse 2, which is about the sins, that's most curious because it almost gets this impression that God is this cosmic judge in heaven that's judging whether or not you've received just punishment for what you've done. Well, we never truly do if you look at it and how we treat each other. 
But God is not this cosmic judge sitting on top of a throne waiting for you to, to push you down the slippery slide to hell, to, to make some type of mistake, to, to get rid of you. That's not what God is doing. It's an image. It's not like God is trying to make sure everything is balanced. This is a, this uh, propitiatory idea of, of salvation that, you know, a sin is made, an exact recompense must be made in its place. That's... Sometimes that's the biblical imagery that's used, but it's just an image. God isn't sitting here balancing the books in that way. This is just a time of despair for these people. It's an image. And you have to also understand that for the Jewish people, sin is not so much about personal behavior. Okay, it's not about looking at a woman with lust, although, you know, that's a bad idea because it breaks relationship with you and your spouse. But it's really about communal responsibilities to justice and peace. It has to do with how we treat the poor. You notice that when Jesus comes and he talks about fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament, what does he say again? I'm here to do what? Feed the poor, clothe the naked, preach good news to those who've been disadvantaged. Jesus Christ has come to address these issues, sometimes very materialistic concerns, justice and peace, okay? So the unjust government of Israel could not stand up to Babylon because they had invested themselves and were consumed by material possessions and comforts. Only once these comforts had been removed could they now focus upon the true comfort that they would receive from God. This is what the prophet is saying. Let's go on. So a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his way in the desert, a highway for God. For every valley shall be raised, every mountain shall be made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places plain. Does this sound familiar? It should. We just read this Sunday. If you were in church on Sunday or if you watched our service from Sunday, you will know we read the lesson in at, for Advent from the Gospel about John the Baptist preparing the way of the Lord. And this was his message. Prepare the way of the Lord. Now, again... There's a literalistic idea or concept behind this of preparing the way of a king. Whenever a king would come into your country or be, be announced that he would be coming, you wanted to make sure your path looked good. You wanted to present your village to the best of possibility because you knew you were going to be, the king was going to be sitting amongst you. But in this case, the king that's going to be sitting in the midst of these people, amidst their poverty, is the Almighty God. Prepare the way. It's not about, again, preparing your personal heart. It's communing, communally preparing our values, who we are, how we present ourselves, that it reflects the God who will be dwelling amongst us. Make straight his path. Now, here's the thing. We, again, think of Jesus, God amidst us. And it is true that this is the God who dwells amongst us in Jesus Christ. However, I would say, I would caution you, that's not what this passage was thinking of. They believed that in the midst of their poverty, in 580 B.C., that God was going to come and sit in amidst them in their hardship, in, amidst their poverty, amidst their suffering and pain. And guess what? They were right. This passage was very particular to that day, that time, that God wanted to dwell amongst them. It isn't only applicable to Jesus Christ, although it does apply to Jesus as well. And so, again, it applies to 580 BC, it applies to Jesus Christ, good old JC, and then it also applies today. In the midst of our despair. Oh, let's, let's, 
um, even in, in the terms of the United States of America. The division that's taking place here. Where is God? God is going to come and sit in our presence. Prepare the way of the Lord. Because God is here with us today. Okay? It goes on. I find this exciting. should be exciting. It's not a judgment. This is a word of comfort. This God isn't coming to sit in our midst to throw stones at us, to pile on. This God is not here to remind us of our sin. This God has come to bring comfort in our time of great despair. I just want to read a few more verses here. <laughs> the grass withers, the flowers fall. Oh, this doesn't sound very hopeful. Just hang on. Surely the breath of the Lord blows on them, and surely people are like grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now that sounds like depressing. Oh, what is he saying again? That you and me were frail and we die. Okay? But God has not come to pile on us. God realizes that we are frail. God realizes that we will die without sustenance. And so for that reason, God comes to dwell amongst us. This will provide us with comfort to get us through these challenging times. Okay? This is what the prophet is telling you. It is a word of comfort. Yes, we are frail. It's an acknowledgement of that. But God, therefore, will dwell with us so that we do not despair and lose hope. You who bring good news to Zion, verse 9, go to the mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice and shout. Jerusalem is destroyed. It's completely demolished. Lift up your voice. Give them hope. Lift up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Your God is here. Your God is dwelling amongst you. Verse 10. See the sovereign Lord comes with power. He will rule with a mighty hand. His reward is with him. His recompense accompanies him. It's all about reconciling relationships. We broke in a relationship with God because we've not cared for the things of God, for justice and love of our neighbor. But God has come to reconcile relationship with us anyway because God knows we're frail, we're dying, we're suffering. And so he comes to be in our presence. He tends to his flock, verse 11. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. And he leads those that have young. How beautiful is that? God will shepherd us. God is our security. You know, this is why I don't understand. And I'm just, I'm being frank with you, my brothers and sisters. I don't understand my right-wing and left-wing brothers and sisters in Christ who somehow think that politics is going to solve our problems if we just vote for right-wingers. If we just vote for left-wingers, my goodness, everything will be different. They seem to both forget that there's 350 million people in this country, okay? And for right-wingers to get what they want and left-wingers to get what they want, we create a totalitarian state. We just don't agree with each other. We just do the best that we can in a country where we disagree. We care for each other, even those who disagree. But we, we've decided that that's not what we're going to do. We're going to depend on a politician to come and deliver us from the evils of those right-wingers or those evils of those left-wingers. People, our hope is not in our politicians. It's a God who dwells in our midst. We look up. We put our trust in God. For God has chosen to dwell amongst us in our time of need. And so I'm here to give you some courage. I don't care 
going back to that politics. If you're a right winger, oh my goodness, I can't believe we got elected. Get over it. It's just a politician. It's just an election. And there'll be many more in this world, in this country to come. So what? Left winger, oh my goodness, we defeated the devil. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. These are just people, okay? We're just a country. These are just politicians. They don't bring us hope. Only Jesus can bring us hope. Stop putting your trust in the politics and the things of this world, in the material blessings of this world. We put our trust in the one who wants to dwell amongst us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that our faith, our hope is not placed in the material blessings of this world or the politicians that run our country. Thank God. It's in Jesus Christ. And so, God, I know that there are people taking all of these things so seriously, and I'm not saying that there aren't consequences for one thing or another. I get it. I get it. Some people being left out now feel put in, are brought back in, and some people who are in feel like they're left out, okay? It's life. Uh, but we do have to care for each other in the midst of this. We do have to treat each other with justice and with peace and with kindness, because that's how you've treated us. You want to dwell in our midst. We need to prepare the way. That means we need to remove uh, those stumbling blocks and those rocks, make straight the path, so that we prepare communally to receive this king who wants to dwell amongst us and our bickering and our fighting and our destroying each other certainly um, is not reflective of the people who want the king being with them. But you're here anyway. And so help us to prepare our hearts. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God's with you. May God give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.